Hello, thank you for clicking. I'm today going to be reviewing the debut album by Sri Lankan UK rapper MIA. This album is titled Arular and it was released on March 22nd, 2005. Completely co-written or written entirely by her and produced predominantly by Switch, Diplo, and Richard X, Ant Whitting, and Greg Fleming. This album took quite a while to finally come to fruition, and it was supposed to release the year prior, but they had trouble getting a sample for one of the songs, You Are A Q T, um, and that kind of ended up delaying it a little bit, um, almost half a year. And obviously it's her first record, so a lot of this was sort of DIY for her, and this was also kind of this experimental thing that wasn't necessarily always going to be an album, but it ended up turning into one. Her moniker, M.I.A., comes from a song on this album titled Amazon, where she talks about I was missing in action. Now, you have to understand more of um, M.I.A. or Matangi, as her real name is, Matangi Arul Pragazam from Sri Lanka. You have to understand a little bit of her backstory. Um, obviously, if anyone's unfamiliar, um, M.I.A. technically considers herself a refugee. She left Sri Lanka when she was very young to live in the U.K. with her mother. She hasn't really had much communication with her father, and his name is Arul. This album is named after him. Arular is kind of the name uh, her father used during the time when he was involved with the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, which is this militant, some people consider a terrorist group, but it's a very controversial issue. In Sri Lanka, in the northern part, there is this ongoing battle between the Sinhalese, who are the sort of ruling you know, Sri Lankan people and the Tamil people who are another branch of, you know, the Indian tribal clan and they want their own independence. Um, and it's, you know, a little bit of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, it's really, because it's just difficult to put your, you know, um, uh, who's really in the right and who's in the wrong. It's, it's a very tricky situation. And MIA has courted controversy by possibly promoting the Tamil Tigers in some of the imagery. I mean, she definitely uses the tiger as sort of a logo and the theme and art this album artwork, although that could be more loosely based as just sort of like a powerful animal and also a symbol of India and Sri Lanka, but also the fact that she is making a statement about, you know, how the West can misconstrue these, you know, political uprisings in other third world countries and how they like to get their fingers in them and, and implement democracy in their own sort of money-grabbing sort of ways. She, you know, never thought that political music would be something people wanted to listen to, but who would have thought that she would actually succeed making sort of more politically charged pop rap music? Um, her music's not really pop, even though she does kind of cross over into that, and she does definitely get a lot of mainstream success from this album. The lead single, Galang, was released years before and was this huge internet sensation, considered one of the first internet viral videos that really helped launch her career. The word Arular also loosely kind of translates in Sri Lankan to being enlightened from the sun. So she felt like all of these things made it the perfect title for this record, and it's really interesting because now that she's named the album after him, if he actually wanted to Google his name, that album would come up and that would lead link him to his daughter and that actually is how the two kind of reconnected and i think that's just a really kind of clever way of her sort of putting her self back into her father's life because that relationship is strained there's actually a documentary that mia filmed years and years ago that has been on hold to be released for years and i've heard it is finally coming out in the beginning of 2018 this is really exciting, and I think I urge people to watch this if anyone's interested in MIA, or also anyone who's interested in, you know, Sri Lanka. Refugee stories, especially people who came to London, this is where she lives. She's always lived in London. And uh, it's really exciting that that's finally happening. Um, growing up, MIA was surrounded by lots of hip-hop, obviously. She cites Public Enemy as, like, one of the best things that ever happened in UK hip-hop. Um, she thinks that this is a very special kind of unique branch of it. Um, also dance hall, she was very inspired by Caribbean music, Brazilian music, and also punk. The punk rock was a huge scene growing up in the 90s in London. She definitely was all around that. And she sort of embraces another genre called Electro Clash, which is something that while she was studying in art school, because she did actually study in the visual arts for college, and that's sort of how she started out. And then she started going into filmmaking. 
And that's kind of how the documentary started to be made. And then she decided to actually record music kind of on her own. Um, and that's how, you know, she designs the album artwork. She definitely has graphic design skills. And you can tell by that because all of her album art is very uniquely her design. Um, some people will call it garish. Some people don't like don't like the covers. I think they're brilliant. Um, I think Arular is one of the better covers that she has made. I think Kala and Arular are the two albums which are kind of the ones named after her mother and father. And some might argue her best albums that she's ever made. Both have really strong album artwork. There are three skits on this album. There's sort of one in the intro, which is called Banana. And there's one called Dash the Curry and one for the head. They're sort of splitting up the album. Banana is really cute. She starts the album by saying, refugee education, number one, sing banana or spell it. Then they have, she's kind of conducting these children to spell the word banana. Um, it, it, it's basically, I mean, some people will just very loosely kind of think, oh, third world countries like Sri Lanka, oh, they have a lot of banana trees. So we have to eat bananas. Um, it's just a common thing that we all have around us all the time. And it's sort of this um, universal sort of language of like primal need of like welfare of like we need to eat these. Like there's that kind of universal need for food, that universal need for um, uh, representation in government. You know, there's these basic human rights that are at the core of the message of so much of MIA's music. And even when it does sometimes feel like it's controversial to Western eyes um, or to anyone, it's always like you have to understand it from her perspective. She has a very unique sort of understanding because of her past experiences with this um, to understand where she comes from, you know, instead of just automatically labeling her as a terrorist sympathizer, like they did in, on the news at one point in the late 2000s, when she sort of supported the Tamil Tigers in some way, and they didn't, they kind of misconstrued what she said. And now she kind of doesn't want to talk about it because she just knows that whatever she says, it's going to be turned against her. Dash the Curry um, sings about, you know, me come from New Delhi, me not got no worry, and if they have with me, I'm going to dash my curry. Um, I think it's just such a cute, but also very sinister and poignant lyric that she sort of just sings over. And it, again, it's sing song. So these are just sort of nice little interludes to kind of place the setting. She um, is inspired by lots of different places and you definitely get a sense of world music in all of her music, which I love. Um, you know, she has the Caribbean sounds on songs like Bingo. Um, she also has that a little bit on ombre, um, and you also have the Indian reference, and especially Tamil reference. Of she like uses a lot of samples from Tamil movies. You know, um, they have their own representation in Bollywood, so she does use that sampling quite a bit. Some East Asian as well, and then of course you know the UK, a little bit more Western European electronic sort of sound um, that she always incorporates. And then also African. So all of this is kind of blended together. Pull Up the People is probably one of the most simplistically constructed and produced like electro pop songs that MIA has ever done. You can definitely tell that, you know, she was not quite at a space where she wanted to go too outside of the norm. A lot of these songs have a very similar beat structure and a little bit of a similar beat backing. You can definitely tell Switches and Diplo's influence in production. Songs like Galang, and pull up the people and the self-named track M.I.A. and um, even Fire Fire. These songs all have a very similar pulsing beat rhythm that sounds very similar, but then there's all this extra stuff layered. I mean, the, the melodies are all very different, if there even really there are that strong of melodies, which there actually really are. She does employ a lot of melody and a lot of choral layering of her own voice. Um, to, you know, create these sort of more anthemic sort of shouted uh, choruses. And Pull Up the People is the most sort of universalist message. She's put it to song in the most transparent. Um, pull Up the People, Pull Up the Poor. It's probably just one of the most anti-capitalistic, you know, but direct messages. Um, and I really appreciate it for that. Um, it's, it's a song that's just meant to bring everyone together, but at the same time highlight all this inequality in the world. Um, Bucky Down Gun is probably one of the best songs on this record for me. It's one of the most unique songs in her discography because of its unique sound and also the fact that the lyrics are so at first head scratching and really bears a lot of research to sort of understand what does Bucky Down Gun even mean? 
London, quiet down, I need to make a sound. New York, quiet down, I need to make a sound. Kingston, quiet down, I need to make a sound. Brazil, quiet down, I need to make a sound. They're coming through the window, they're coming through the door, they're busting down the big wall and sounding the horn. What you want, Bucky Dungun? What you want, that fire done burn? What do you want, Bucky Dungun, get cracking, get, get cracking? The song was a huge hit in Brazil because it styles this Brazilian braille. I am not really sure how to pronounce it. Um, but there's the favelas in, in like Rio de Janeiro, for example, and um, favela funk is like a style of music that's very popular, and this song was basically paying homage to that. It was the first time they'd heard this sort of song played on commercial radio, um, and their music sort of being represented. And um, it was a big moment for them. And it has since inspired a lot of Brazilian ghetto groove artists to sort of break out in the scene in Brazil. It was, it was revolutionary. Critics praised this song. And I think that the fact that, you know, the horn section is so catchy and so um, undeniable, um, it just so is so clear cutting that I think that sort of makes it the most memorable song on this album. You will always remember the horn section. A lot of the other songs kind of do blend together that if you don't listen to them for a while, you might forget exactly how they sound because there's more subtleties to differentiation in sound. On another huge hit, Sun Showers, considered a down-tempo jungle, dan jungle dance song. You definitely get that jungle groove going through this song. I mean, it almost sounds like the coconut is being used. And the music video was also filmed in Sri Lanka and in the jungle with all these people sort of, I salt and pepper my mango, shoot spit at the window. I bongo with my lingo, beat it like a wing yo, can't stereotype my thing yo. It's cute and catchy, but it's again, like very direct in its sort of hip-hop funk um, aesthetic and also the fact that it's very, again, politically charged. The sun showers that fall on my troubles are over you, my baby. And some showers I'll be aiming at you because I'm watching you, my baby. Thematically, MIA has described this song to be about how in the news everything is so cut and dry, good versus evil, when in reality it's actually so much more complicated than that. And, you know, where it gets political is she talks about gun culture. You know, at the time, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of UK, was, you know, they were being so anti-gun in the fact that, you know, in terms of the UK, they can't have guns. But when someone strikes them like a terrorist group, we have to strike back twice as hard. There's sort of this hypocritical stance. Um, if you're really going to be a pacifist and, you know, disavow all gun culture, then you have to disavow, you know, um, retaliatory counterterrorism acts in the Middle East or in other parts of Asia and Africa. And it's something that I can understand where she comes from. I mean, there's this argument that in the developed world, should we have guns or should we not, you know, and of course I believe that we shouldn't, but there's all of this sort of hypocritical sort of, um, the, you know, the fact that we're so quick to use it on these, on these other people and drop bombs on them. Um, where is the line between right and wrong? Put away your stupid gun, yo, because we see through like protocol. That's why we blow it up before we go. It's like we're we're gonna shut down any you know um, any second guessing of this system because it benefits us, but we're gonna shut and silence down people who might be subjected to it. Um, because again, like to someone who's getting bombs dropped on them in the Middle East, the the relationship to the U.S. and the West in violence is very different to how we perceive it. Um, you know, we may think we're getting the bad guys, but we're also getting a lot of people who are completely innocent and. In a lot of these cultures and countries, you know, it's uh, people just need to survive and it's a very, you know, violent sort of place and that they, they might need guns to survive. It's a really tragic sort of system that we've created. Um, ultimately, we want peace, but we have to ignore, acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of lives being lost and we need to do something about that. Fire Fire is another unapologetically political song. Um, I, you know, she talks about guerrilla warfare, she talks about loading up, aim, fire, fire, pop, uh, rowing the boat through the ocean, signal the plane. But then she also name drops all these huge pop bags like Timbaland and Missy Elliott and Lou Reed, the Pixies and the Beasties. Um, and basically this song she made just kind of to be an in-your-face sort of political song to say, I can make political pop music. I don't want to brainwash people into dumbing down my music and my image to cater to pop radio. Um, and she kind of feels this song is actually less about 
you know, Middle East conflict or, you know, geopolitical conflict and more about the music industry itself and how the, the dumbing down and getting fame is converse to the messages that come through the music. And she doesn't want to be a part of that whatsoever. Despite all that, it's very direct um, and it's, it's very, very groovy and it has this energy to it that is infectious. I definitely think it's a highlight. So probably one of the most autobiographical songs that M.I.A. has ever written would be Amazon, basically talking about growing up in Sri Lanka and the ensuing sort of refugee status that her family had to kind of uptake. Even though she was never in the Amazon, she's sort of using that as sort of this metaphor, but at the same time also referencing it like literally. Painted nails, sunsets on horizons, palm trees, silhouettes smell amazing, blindfolds under homemade lanterns, somewhere in the Amazon they're holding me ransom. I already said that she talked about how the MIA moniker kind of was kind of inspired through the writing of this song when she talks about I was missing in action. Hello, this is MIA. It's okay, you forgot me. Um, now it's sort of her speaking to the fact that there's this es essence of forgottenness to these refugees and these people who have had to force to assimilate into other cultures. And um, it, it's, it's a tricky situation. Again, there's a, definitely a jungle sound to this, a marimba sound that I think is really catchy. There's a bit of Caribbean in there as well. Obviously, the Amazon is influenced, so it's going to have that sort of style. Um, there's some ambient sort of jungle sounds in the background. And I think it's one of the most pleasantly fun. I don't want to say pleasant, but it's one of the funnest songs to listen to. Um, it's very interesting and aesthetically pleasing for me. Um, she's a little bit more refined. She's not as abrasive in her delivery of this song, and a lot of the other songs are a little bit more punching. Um, and even though this song still is a very important message, all of these songs are kind of dire in that. Um, she delivers it in a little bit more of a hushed sort of uh, stance, although it's also very hurried. She definitely hurries through these lines very fast, um, and it's something a staple of her music, and of course of rap music in general. Bingo has this undeniable Caribbean flair. You drink too much rum, you make me want to run. I make no assumption. Ass will get the hump on. What's the point of talking gun? I done been Brixton bombed. That's why I don't run, for the sake of having fun. Because bingo, now I'm hitting the six. Ombre is interesting because she actually had these toys from India that she would play with as a kid, and she used them to sort of create some of the backing drum sounds in this album, on this song, as well as sounds of like, um, like cell phones. And you know, I see this as a bit of a reflection of, you know, uh, just more relationships in general and this um, promiscuity. Boy garato piga minha numero. The beginning of the song is in Portuguese, um, and it's funny because I, when I heard numero, I always thought it was Spanish, but researching it, she sings it in Portuguese. Um, and the chorus is, excuse me, little hombre, can take my number, call me, I can get squeaky so you could come and oil me. It's, it's this cautionary reflection on, you know, gut culture, um, date rape, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a very feminist song. I mean, M.I.A. is upon apologetically feminist, and she's not afraid to, to poke fun at things like the falsities of the nuclear family, family or the the issues of consent, um, you know, she she addresses these in like the most cheeky and clever way, and um, her lyrics always kind of make you laugh, but at the same time, you know the point she's getting across, and that's why she's such a brilliant um, songwriter. Ten Dollar um, is one of the best songs on this record because it's all so catchy and it's so energized, it's so well produced, um, it has all the right flavors going into it. But on top of that, it's a subject that is so beautifully dealt with. It's a really dark subject, but it's also this controversial thing about teenage prostitutes who um, in third world countries will use their clients as gateways to the Western world, you know, use them as tickets for independence and escape. Um, and so in some ways they're getting a lot more than, you know, a lot of people assume that, you know, um, and demonize prostitution, but it's, it serves a purpose in these impoverished countries. Um, and, and, and then the fact that she has the song $10, what can $10 buy you? Well, anything you want. Um, the truth is, is that, you know, yeah, $10, you're speaking to a man. It's like, oh, well, could this actually give me beyond just sex, it could give you freedom? Um, you know, the fact that you, uh, um, if you, if you pay me, you know, if you pay me as a woman $10, I can also help you um, to escape 
you know, and vice versa. Could be the other way around, you know, if you're talking about male prostitutes as well. Lolita was a man-eater, clocked him like a taxi meter. You have to sing it in her um, Cockney accent, which is very distinct. Mita. Ita. Um, Chinna girl grew up to be a big girl, had her sights set on a bigger world. Dial a bride from Sri Lanka, found herself a Yorkshire banker. Banker, but banker, as she says that she can rely, she rhymes words that you wouldn't normally rhyme if you spoke in an Eng uh, American accent, but she has, again, such a distinct um, uh, London accent. So you get the message, you know, um, of, you know, this understanding of freedom having this actually very kind of cheap cost, but it's actually a moral cost that's so much higher. But why, you know, reflecting on this broken system, but the fact that, you know, again, what is right and what is wrong? Um, to the West, this may all seem perverse, but this is actually the only system they know they can use to actually um, make a better living for themselves. You Are A QT is just a, f I mean, it's a cute, fun little song, a little bit about like someone who is cheating. But again, you know, she takes the like the, you know, uh, domestic um, relationship um, issue to this huge or broader level by throwing in references to uh, drug dealing, um, you know, the, these, you know, talking about shrapnels and the rebel. Uh, so she always opens things up to being so broad and uh, so much about um, geopolitical struggle and warfare. Um, you know, she, she kind of uses warfare as metaphors for personal um, vendettas or personal issues sometimes, and I can see why she'd want to do that. Um, it has, it's a very unique sort of uh, way to get a point across. So Galang, like I said, is one of the hugest and most successful MIA songs. Um, it has a really fun music video where she's also using like a stencil um, to print um, her moniker and her name, and it's, it's just a fun like getting all the people up and dancing, but it's also like got this strong message. Um, Galang is a street slang word, meaning basically keeping like a low profile. Don't start any trouble, just go with the flow. And so the song is basically a diss at that fact that you're told to keep a low profile, to fit in with society, um, and to go with the flow, um, embrace the status quo, and also a little bit every man for himself. Who the hell is hounding you in the BMW? How the hell he find you? 147 you. The Fed's gonna get you. Pull the strings on the hood. One paranoid youth blazing through the hood. Who the hell? You know, I mean, it, it speaks to, you know, um, a very universal understanding of the street and people surviving um, to get by in whatever system they're, in, you know, brought up in. Um, a lot of people are confined by it. London calling, speak the slang now. Boys say wah guan, girls say wah wah. I mean, these these are slang terms that I don't really understand, and I don't really need to. Um, I will say this: um, it's really hard to analyze Memaye's lyrics because they are so um, culturally specific, and a lot of them are not Western. So it's very difficult, um, especially as an American, to understand the slang references, to understand some of the obscure um, hip-hop references or obscure cultural references that she throws into these lyrics. I never take it too seriously. I always kind of just think of sometimes it's just, it's just sound. I'm like, I'm not a big rap listener, so, you know, sometimes it's just wh whatever it comes through comes through, but others doesn't have to come through lyrically. It can just be what it is. It's just rhythm. It's just dictation. Because she has a very fast delivery on this song. But then it has that triumphant bass pound as they sing, ya, ya, eh. And I, it's so memorable and catchy. Like I said, it's one of those memorable choruses. The song M.I.A., which she named after herself. It's a little bit of a bonus track. It was originally called Pop on a mixtape that she released before called Piracy Funds Terror Terrorism. It's sort of this cautionary, um, sweeping sort of... Uh, you know, revelatory track about um, questioning who is your leader and who is the follower. Your prime minister to your employer. Ego lovers need more power. Trendsetters make things better. Don't sell out to be product pushers. Um, she also says you can watch TV and watch the media. President Bush doing takeover. This was during the Bush years, obviously. Kate Moss and ads for mascara. All my youth, the youth offend, young offender. The bill payers, the drug dealers, girls who are on magazine covers the part-time jobbers at the call center, no career plans because you won't get far, put away change for Ibiza, and check your credit on your new Nokia. 
Um, this idea that, you know, we all have cell phones, but we're all broke. Um, we're all, you know, connected to this corporate system that's kind of broken and not benefiting us, but only benefiting the ultra rich. Um, you know, materialism run rampant, um, beauty standards, you know, magazine covers, um, feminism, all of these things are addressed. Um, obviously, um, the U.S. is, you know, corporately funded uh, democracy, um, you know, crusades in the Middle East. Um, obviously, this was right around a time that Bush had invaded Iraq. So that was very much fueling a lot of this fire. And it's a it's a very poignant song and it tells it like it is. And I think it's one of the most direct times Amaya has ever been politically. And Arular ultimately is her most political album. All of her albums are political, but she's the most explicit on this one. Kala to some extent as well. These are two like sister and brother albums. I have reviewed Kala or Kala as she pronounces it. Um, and I really love that album. And I actually like that album a little bit more than this one. Um, but they're both really good albums. I can see why these are sort of the two big albums that sort of launched her career and gave her the most success in terms of singles and radio play and album sales. But I also love her later stuff. I'm going to review all of her records, but if you want to check out my Cal review, I'll link it in the description. I hope you enjoyed this review. Again, it's really tricky to, to, to talk around and make sure you say the right thing about her lyrics because some of these things are very vague and she doesn't explain a lot of her songs. So no one really knows what she's really talking about unless you, you happen to, to know about a certain cultural reference. But, you know, there is so much to dissect. And, you know, she's one of the few rappers that I really respect and love. And not to say that I have anything against rap music. You just, I'm not a big hip hop fan. Um, I do listen to it casually, occasionally. But um, M.I.A. Is sort of transcends that for me because her music is just so poignant and so much more kind of direct and it's sort of... Um, altruistic message, even though some people may see it as coming off cross very violent or very, like, too transparent, you know, too direct and abrasive. Um, I appreciate that. I mean, she's been through a lot and people are going through way worse and she's sort of the under, she's sort of representing them. She makes music for the un underprivileged, for the unheard, especially in the eyes of the West. And so she bridges that pretty beautifully, you know, East and West and sort of is like a microphone. Um, from the East to the West saying like, listen, there's other kinds of stuff going on, you know, um, I'll wrap this up here. Um, I hope you enjoyed this review and uh, let me know in the comments what you think about MIA in this record and I will see you in my next review. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day. Bye.